It only took three years, but we're here. So thank you guys. for. <laughs> um, I just want to welcome you all uh, to our church this morning. And yes, as the choir is coming up, um, we always start off every Sunday with a psalm reading. So I'm going to be reading from Psalm 95, verses 1 through 6. It says this. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving, and let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God, amen? amen, and a great king above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth, the heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. Well, right from that psalm, let's sing that. and Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our God. Let's stand as we sing. singing. Great to be here and worship together. Worship and bow down. Now this next song is a great hymn of the faith. We've sung it recently, but it's great because our focus this morning is on God, the creator. Let's sing together. We praise thee, O God, our redeemer, creator. It's number 68 if you want to turn. Hey. 
Now let's turn to those around us and greet them in love and with joy. Good morning, church. <laughs> Just a few announcements this morning. Um, first, the connection cards in the pews. Um, you just let us know you're here, your prayer requests, uh, anything we need to know. They're right there in the pews in front of you. Um, also, family camps coming up the 9th through the 13th in Big Bear. Um, I encourage you to come if you have families. It's just a wonderful time of fellowship. We just have so much fun, and, and then we eat together, and we worship around the campfire in the evening. So yeah, I'll be thinking about that. And also our backpack ministry. We still need um, our donations, backpacks, um, school supplies, um, decent quality school supplies for kids of the South Bay. We appreciate it. Um, if you can't do that or don't have time, we also take monetary donations, and we'll get the supplies. So, and finally, um, please join us for a reception for Jeremy after in the annex. Um, so we can um, thank him for his uh, ministry here over the last three years, and um, we can celebrate him. Yeah, thank you. So, y'all, I'm going to tell you a little bit about how camp was. So, um, can I have the leaders uh, who were leading these students come up with us, please? Because these were the real MVPs, so can we clap it up for them? <laughs> yeah, Ms. Dom, that means you too. So, no, it's okay. She'll, oh, just, go, just make your way down. It's okay. We'll wait. Just kidding. We won't. Um, <laughs> I, first of all, just want to say that... Um, Man, this whole week would not have been possible without our leaders. Uh, we tried to give our students a frame of mind about what it is that these leaders are sacrificing to be there. It's not that you guys, you students, are just the most loveliest people in the world, and we as adults have nothing better to do with our time than just to just bow down at your feet. Um, <laughs> we did it because we love you guys. Um, and then that means sacrificing time with our families. That means sacrificing all this stuff, but it's worth it. And we saw that over the course of the week. Uh, the things that the students learned was, well, I think the thing that stuck out to me most was, here's the truths of God, and here are the lies of the devil. And the whole week was about unveiling those truths and those lies. And a lot of those lies had to do with our identity. And so it makes us question ourselves when, we were created by God in his image, with purpose, with value. And so it was so cool to see the speaker speak truth into their lives and then with us as their leaders be able to go into small group time and just kind of like unpack what that means. So it was such a beautiful time. Um, the thing that is, geez, most on my mind right now is uh, the high schoolers and I, uh, we stayed up the entire night, that entire last night. And so... Oh, jeez. <laughs> uh, so I, I went to a local gas station, got a whole bunch of snacks for all of the students, and then after that, we just had a really good time together. Um, and then it was like 6.30 in the morning, and we wake up, we're taking pictures on the field with a beautiful sunrise. Um, some of the students ended up like just throwing up because that's what happens when you stay up. Um, <laughs> I will not name who. I will just look in this direction. The thing I want to say in addition to saying thank you to our leaders is um, students, we love you and we thank you guys for, for taking time. We had 21 of our junior hires and high schoolers come with us and it was just an awesome time. Um, <laughs> there obviously are behavioral things of when, when kids are not a, like next to their parents, then it's just like, ooh, let's test out boundaries and all that stuff. And we as leaders did our best to be patient and loving and kind to promote the fruits of the spirit. <laughs> but it was that last night when we were doing reflections and uh, we sang the song Holy Spirit all together in unison and they were just sharing about what are the things that, that as students they need to just give up 
when, they're, when they come down from the mountain? And then what are things that they need to do that they're called to do by God for the sake of the kingdom? It was just such a beautiful time. And so I will remember that for the rest of my life. So I hope and pray that for you students, it was just a wonderful time that God was able to use that experience. And please remember these leaders because they love you so much. So if we can just clap up for the leaders and just for the everything one more time. So bands, that's next, right? Um, if you may stand up with us, we are going to be uh, singing in the time of worship. So Pastor Jared, please lead us. Thank you, Jeremy, and uh, again, hope you guys will stick around afterwards and join us um, to send this guy off and trusting in God's goodness and grace. Um, if you watched the announcements earlier, you might have seen that there is no youth group tonight. That is a lie. There is <laughs> high school group tonight. Come on down. Uh, we'll be having a great time together. Um, you get to hang out with me, I guess. You know, I don't know. If you really want to come out. I'm just kidding. Come on down, and we'll have a great time. And then junior high, yes, we'll be on Wednesday night as well. Uh, today, we're talking about God as creator. Um, and this song is at, his, at your name. The mountains shake and crumble. The oceans roar and tumble. Angels will bow. The earth will rejoice. Because he is Lord. Amen. Sing with me at your name, at your name. The mountain shake and crumble. At your name, the oceans roar and tumble. At your name, angels will bow. Earth will rejoice, the people cry out. Lord of all the earth, we shout your name, shout your name, filling up the skies with endless praise, endless praise. Yahweh, Yahweh, we love to shout your name, oh Lord. At your name, at your name. Praise 
same God who created the heavens and the earth and everything in them is the same God today, amen? Same God who led his people through the wilderness, across the Red Sea, who made covenants. The same God who keeps his promises today, amen? Amen. of God is he? You are the same God. You are the same God. You were providing then. You are providing now. You are the same God. You are the same God. You moved in power then. God moved in power
God, my God, I need you now. I'm sure that there are so many in this room whose cry of their heart, whose prayer right now is, oh God, my God, I need you now. And Lord, we thank you, God, that when we cry out to you, when you see our needs, you look down and you hear us and you know us. You are our Father. Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so, Lord God, if there's anyone right now who, who truly is crying out, my God, my God, I need you, which might actually be all of us, that you would reach down, show us, Lord, that you don't change, that you never have, that you are the same God yesterday, today, and forever. And we can trust you. Teach us to trust. Teach us to believe. You're the same God. And it's in his awesome name we pray. Amen. Go ahead and take your seats, Raj. Come and bless us today, brother. Aren't you glad we worship a wonderful Lord? Oh, dear people, we can do better than that. <laughs> Aren't you glad we worship a wonderful Lord? Amen. Amen. We worship a real God for real sinners. A real God who delights in ministering to the needs of his people like us. And this morning, our wonderful God is here today by his grace to minister to each of us. And I pray we know that today. And whatever your need might be, I pray that you know that he is here for you. Well, good morning. Last week, it was as we began our study in the Apostles' Creed, Pastor Jared wonderfully spoke to us about God's existence, God's essence, his holiness and attributes, and how we rejoice that this wonderful God loves us. Would you turn to your neighbor and say to them, God loves you. Turn to your neighbor, God loves you. <laughs> You'd be amazed that how many people do not know that, that God loves them. They think God is angry at them, that he wants to punish them rather than being the God that the Bible declares him to be. Well, we learned that to speak about God as our father, as Pastor Jared shared last week, is to speak of his righteous authority and care. But may we also realize that it speaks of his creativity. And this points us to the absolute fact that we are here because God brought us into being. And in understanding this truth, we see that everything that has been brought into existence by God belongs to God. As I was preparing my message this last week, an old song, I'm, I'm dating myself now, an old song came into my mind. It's simple verse, but it's very, very powerful. 
It's by John W. Peterson. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Now, a simple verse, but listen to the truth. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills, the wealth in every mine. He owns the rivers and the rocks and the rills, the sun and the stars that shine. Wonderful riches, more than tongue can tell. He is my father. So they're mine as well. You didn't think you had anything, did you? <laughs> they're yours as well. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills, and I know that he will care for me. What a wonderful father. What a wonderful God. And how thankful we are this morning that God in his great love and mercy takes care of us. But now this morning as we continue our study in the Apostles' Creed, we turn our attention to what it says next. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. This morning, we shall learn about God, our glorious creator. And as we think of God, our glorious creator, we first of all think of his awesome power, his awesome power. In Genesis 1.1, it declares, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The opening verse in Genesis 1.1 is what we call a topic sentence. It says that because it summarizes the entire chapter of what we are going to read. And the word created here is used of God's creative activity. It speaks of that which only God can do. It also signifies something new and remarkable has been established out of absolutely nothing. That this was a creation without pre-existing materials. Our God is an awesome God. He can do anything, and he did back in eternity past when he created the world, the universe. Now, how did he do it? Well, in Psalm 33, 9, we are told, for he spoke, and it came to be. He commanded, and it stood firm. Know this today, dear family. Our God is the one who is in control of this universe, this world, not man. It is God himself who is in control of what he has created. We look to him for his guidance, for his strength, and his deliverance. Oh, the absolute power which belongs to God as he brought our world into being. And now along with Genesis 1 and 2, Psalm 104 verses 1 through 9 gives us the grandeur of what he did when he created the universe. The psalmist says this, Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord, my God, you are very great. You are clothed with splendor and majesty, covering yourself with light as with a garment, stretching out the heavens like a tent. He lays the beams of his chambers on the waters. He makes the clouds his chariot. He rides on the wings of the winds. He makes his messengers winds, his ministers a flaming fire. He set the earth on its foundations so that it should never be moved. Remember that. He sets the earth on its foundations so that it should never be moved. He covered it with the deep as with a garment. The waters stood above the mountains. At your rebuke, they fled. At the sound of your thunder, they took to flight. The mountains rose. The valley sank down to the place that you appointed for them. You set a boundary that they may not pass so that they may not again cover the earth. This is our God, our wonderful creator. I have many things here that I could share with you about what we just read, but we don't have time. So let me highlight one of them for you. In verse 2, the psalmist spoke of the heavens. I have some things for us. It'll boggle your minds. Scientists tell us that the universe is approximately 95 billion light years in diameter. Can you believe it? But this is only the beginning. A question had been asked, how much bigger is the universe than what we can see? Well, according to the 2011 MIT, that's Massachusetts Institute of Technology, according to their review, they found that the universe is at least 250 times larger than the observable universe, or at least 7 trillion light years across. 
Can you believe it? Seven trillion light years across. And remember, the speed of light is what? 186,000 miles per second. My goodness, the vastness that God has created. And then according to astronomy.com, it is estimated that there are, get, get ready, 700 quintillion planets in our universe. That's one followed by 18 zeros. But that's not all. They also estimate that there are approximately 200 billion trillion stars using the Milky Way as their model. That's approximately 200 sextillion stars. That's one followed by 21 zeros. Aren't you glad you didn't have to have that in math? <laughs> My goodness. But as great as that is, here's the awesomeness of our God. In Psalm 147.4, God's word tells us, He determines the number of the stars, and He gives all of them their name. How awesome is our God, all of those stars, and yet they are personally known to Him. He gives them all their names. You talk about an awesome God full of power. That's our Lord. And then in Genesis 1, we find that God stated six times that he saw that everything that he made, that it was good. But as mind-boggling as all of this is, we understand that Almighty God, the Creator, and Sovereign Lord of the universe, and I choose those words carefully, he is the Sovereign Lord of the universe. No one takes his place. No one comes near him. He desires to have a personal relationship with you and me. And as I say that, in my own way, I call this his personal touch in creation. In Genesis 1, 26 and 27, God's word says this. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created him. The words in our image define our unique, man's unique relationship to God. We as living beings are the only ones of God's creation who are capable of communicable attributes. Say that three times. Communicable attributes. We alone can do that. We alone can, can think, reason, have intellect, will, and emotion. And at the beginning, before the fall, when there was no sin, man, in a moral sense, was like God in that he was good and sinless. And as individual persons, male and female, they equally shared God's image and together exercised dominion over all of God's creation. And by his divine design, they were physically diverse in order to accomplish God's mandate to multiply on the earth. We know that to say that neither one could reproduce offspring without the other. But then now notice with me the difference with which God created mankind, how he, we are different from the rest of his creation. In Genesis 2, 5 through 7, we have God's words about the first man, Adam. When no bush of the field was yet in the land, and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had caused it to rain, had not caused it to rain on the land, and there was no man to work the ground. And the mist was going up from the land and was watering the whole face of the ground. Now here it is. Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living creature. The word formed is tremendously important to us. We call it a pictorial in nature, it describes the work of a potter. May I use this expression? As God created an Adam, it was hands-on. It was personal. This leads us to believe that the dust from the ground should actually be understood as clay. 
And so we have the image pictured here of God himself at the potter's wheel fashioning the body of a man. And as we think of that, this is indeed a wondrous image of God's love and his grace, his careful attention to what he was doing, knowing that he that, that was creating him was creating him for a personal relationship whereby we would be able to know him, understand him, love him, and obey him. Yes, he formed Adam, the first man on the earth. And then verse 7 of Genesis 2 tells us in God's creation that he breathed into the nostrils the mouth of life. Think of it. God breathed directly into Adam's lungs, into his lungs. He just didn't give him life as he did all of the other creatures that he had created. He personally breathed into his lung. Dear family, we hear lots of things in school as we've grown up, and they're teaching lots of things in science class in universities today. But mankind alone is unique among all that God has created. We alone can have wonderful personal communication with God, our creator. And how wonderful that is. And when he bids us to come to him and pray, no, as he calls us to pray, he listens. He listens to us, his creation. But then what about Eve? What do we know about this first woman? Well, in Genesis 2, 18 through 23, this is awesome. Then the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. You wondered where those animals got their name? <laughs> it was from Adam. The man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens, to every beast of the field. But for Adam... There was not found a helper fit or suitable for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, he took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made or he fashioned specifically. He looked, he fashioned a creature that would answer to Adam's needs. And he brought her to the man. Then the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Now notice, please, what it said that of all of the creatures that God had created, beautiful as they were, none of them could meet the needs of this man, Adam. So God did this surgery, the first surgery known to mankind, and the first healing, he brought Adam out of it. <laughs> He created this wonderful creature, this wonderful woman that we know as Eve. Now, we see what Adam said here as he saw her, but I need to be honest with you. If I'd been there that day in the Garden of Eden and I had named all those animals, the hippo, the rhino, the, the elephants and the dockings, and all of those other animals as they came by me, and then I woke up, and I saw this beautiful creature looking at me, I don't think I would have said what Adam said. I think I would have said something like, wow, for me? <laughs> what a wonderful, wonderful God that he created someone for Adam to minister to his needs. Jeremy said amen. <laughs> All after aside, I'm serious. Can you imagine? You're looking at all of these animals. Oh, my goodness, that's not going to help me. <laughs> the rhino lumbers by. And then you do come out of this, and you see this glorious creature, this person that's going to answer to the needs of his heart, the needs that he has. We men understand that. And for those of us who have been given a loving, wonderful wife, we can say, amen. How our wives answer to our needs. And so the hands-on creation of Adam and Eve shows us the importance that God, our wonderful creator, had in making us rational beings so that we could love him 
have a personal relationship with him and enjoy an everlasting relationship with him. But also in that he created male and female, we understand that God had something else in mind. He had the family in mind, the basic unit of society. Yes, the building block of society with God as its head. Dear people, we need to pray for our families today around the world. So many families do not know their uniqueness before God. They do not understand the uniqueness they have as mom and dad and children. But then in Genesis 1.31, we are told that with the inclusion of Adam and Eve, God didn't say it was just good. He said it was very good. Oh, how awesome is that? His, his creation declares his glory. In Psalm 108, verse 5, we are told, Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. But then sadly, after all God did in creating personally Adam and Eve, we see that they, in exercising their free will, chose to disobey the righteous commands which God gave to them. And because of this, God's creation was marred. Yes, sin entered the world. Sin is an immoral act against God, a transgression of divine law. It's also described as a missing of the mark of God's holy standard. And what did this sin do? It destroys. We see the destructiveness of sin. Genesis 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say, You shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the, and the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was desired to make one wise. She took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he Eight. Notice, please, in verse 1, that Satan planted a seed of doubt in Eve's mind. Did God really say that? And then in verse 4, Satan flat out lied, for his lie to Eve's and Adam's brought death, spiritual death. Satan promises great benefits to us people, but he's a liar and the father of lies. The Lord Jesus said that. And what he promises, he cannot deliver. He only delivers loss. In verse 6, Eve played with this temptation. She saw, she delighted, she desired, and then she took, and the world was plunged into spiritual darkness. Now, what happened when the world was plunged into spiritual darkness? Their eyes were opened, and they realized they were separated from God. Genesis 3, 7 then the eyes of both were open, and they knew that they were naked and sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And when Adam and Eve ate of the fruit, sin and death became earth's realities, physical and spiritual death. And because of their sin, guilt now entered their consciousness. They tried to cover their nakedness, their disobedience, but they could not do it. And this is something that man has tried to do from the beginning of time through good works and religion, but that can never cover sin. It can never work. Why? Because Isaiah 64, 6 tells us, we have all become like one who was unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. We all fade like a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind take us away. This was true of Adam and Eve, and it has been true of every one of us. But then God's word tells us that all of mankind, because of sin, is guilty before him. 
before God. In Romans 8, at verse 18, it tells us this. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, what are they? Namely, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor as him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, God's word says they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Blaise Pascal made this statement. He's a French mathematician. He said this, and it's very, very true. There is a God-shaped gap within us. And Augustine, writing in the early 5th century, made this statement. You made us for yourself, O Lord. And our hearts are restless until they find rest in you. How true. And if mankind refuses to find this spiritual rest in God our creator, suppressing his truth and refusing to acknowledge his glory, they will worship a false god. And they've done that also from the beginning. Here Dr. Warren Wiersbe makes this statement. They have exchanged the glory of the true God for substitute gods that they themselves have made. They exchange glory for shame in corruption for corruption and truth for lies. And it needs to be understood, because many people don't understand this today, that if they die in this state of spiritual unbelief, that they will spend eternity in hell separated from God. And dear friends, how absolutely tragic that will be. We don't hear the word hell today from many pulpits. And the reason we don't hear it is because it is not socially acceptable. But God says that anyone without Christ, when the time comes to meet him, if they do not know the Lord, they cannot spend eternity with God, their creator. Well, the question is, is asked, how can this horrible situation be corrected? Is there not a remedy? Praise God, there is. For an eternity past, God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, already had the answer in place. It is here that Alistair McGrath so wonderfully made this statement. He says this, the ultimate demonstration of God's continuing concern and involvement with his creation is his act of redemption in Jesus Christ. You see, the creation is the theater in which the great drama of redemption is played out. In eternity past, God already had the plan. It was, it was within his will. You see, God's creation needed to be redeemed. In Isaiah 64, 6, as I read earlier, we see that you and I are incapable of meeting what God says is, is righteousness. All our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. We need a redeemer. And because of God's great love for us, our creator himself redeemed us. John 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. And without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. These verses are powerful to us, talking about God, our creator. They emphatically speak of the Lord Jesus Christ. He alone is the word of whom John speaks. And by calling Jesus the word, John emphasizes that Jesus alone is the revelation from the Father. He also is God, the second person of the Trinity. He was eternal.
and the verb was, and verse 1 tells us that he, he, before the universe began, the second person of the Trinity, Jesus Christ, always existed. He always has been. He is the creator. He's the Father's agent involved in creating everything in the universe. And in him, verse 4 says, was life. And the life was the light of men. How thankful I am today that God did not say that if we were to have a personal relationship with him, that we had to earn our way to him. Now, don't raise your hands, because there shouldn't be any. How many of us could earn our way to the Father? Not any one of us, not one. We need the Redeemer, and the Father has provided him. In John 14, 6, the Lord Jesus said of himself, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And in John 8, 12, the Lord Jesus also declared of himself, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. But we ask for the Redeemer, for the Creator to become our Redeemer, what did it cost him? It cost him everything. In Isaiah 53, 5 and 6, the prophet Isaiah says this about our creator Jesus who died for us. Notice the descriptive words that he uses in these two verses. But he, Jesus, our creator, was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquity. Upon him was the chastisement, the punishment, the penalty, that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity, the guilt of us all. Of this passage of scripture, Charles Spurgeon shares something very wonderful. He says, it is wonderful how complete was the interchange of positions between Christ and his people. Notice, so that what they were, he became, in order that what he is, they may become. This is how closely he became like his brethren. To liken the Son of God to a sheep would have been an unpardonable presumption had not God employed the same figure in the Passover. Jesus knew our need, and he became for us representative sin. When he died on the cross, he died for you and for me. And by faith in his name, we receive from him that which he is, the life and light which comes from the Father. It is, as the Apostle Paul said in Ephesians 1.7, in him, in Christ the Creator, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. When we think about creation, we may just think of something in general, but never think of creation in general. It is specific. It speaks of God himself doing what no one else can do. It speaks of God doing for us what we could not do for ourselves, providing what we could never provide for ourselves, a rebirth. And that's what our creator, our redeemer, has done for us. You see, he paid the required ransom to buy you and me as sinners out of the bondage that we were in. Think of it. He bought us out of the slave market of iniquity, of sin. He, our awesome creator, became our glorious redeemer. Do you remember, have you thought recently about when you believed upon the Lord Jesus Christ and you, you wanted him to be the one to cleanse you of your sin? You wanted to present your life to him. You wanted to live for him. Dear people, what a glorious day that is. Never, never discount that, that decision you made for Christ. It's the most important decision anyone can ever make in their life to receive this creator, this redeemer, into our lives. You see, Christ, Almighty God, the Creator, loves each and every one of us personally. 
You're not a number. You're not an it. You are an individual, a person. And in John chapter 10, Jesus said that he knows each of his sheep by name. He knows all those stars by name. And he knows us by name. What a wonderful God. What a wonderful creator. What a wonderful redeemer. But we need to remember something very practical this morning. God's creation still needs care. This world belongs to God. He created it. He redeemed it. It's his. And as children, out of love for him, he's asked you and me to take care of it. Our creator's word to Adam so many years ago still speaks to us today. We may not realize it. In Genesis 2.15, it says this. The Lord God placed a man in the garden to tend and watch over it. It's our privilege as his children, out of love for him, to do what we can, take care of this earth which he created. But may we realize today the creation that is so precious to him is you, is me. He personally crafted mankind in his image He breathed into Adam the breath of life, and Adam became a living soul. We alone live for eternity. The question is, where will people live for eternity? With the Father or separated from him? Well, God's creation still needs care, and out of love for him, he invites us to take care of his creation. Would you look at the ending thought there on your notes if you have the notes before you? I'd like you to look there with me and then at the very end I'm going to ask you to read the last sentence with me. Humans are stewards of God's creation blessings and should use his gifts as he commands. Until Jesus comes again, may we cooperate with him and seek to be, here it is, faithful stewards of what he has entrusted to us. It is our privilege to glorify God even in this. And now would you read that last line with me, please? All praise to God, our glorious creator. Oh, when we hear that word creator, may it resonate within us, dear family. He created us for himself. And as he calls us to a personal relationship with him, we nurture that relationship with him as we spend time alone with our creator in his word and in prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your wonderful word. We thank you that, oh God, you are our creator. You are our redeemer. You know us far better than we know ourselves. And Lord, we're so thankful that even today, after all these years have gone by, you are still reaching out to us. Some here this morning may not understand that. They may not even believe it. But Heavenly Father, I pray that you will open their minds, open their understanding to know how much you love them. You created them for a purpose, that they might now know you, have fellowship with you now, and spend eternity with you in heaven. Oh, Lord Jesus, thank you, thank you, thank you, Lord Jesus, for being our creator, our redeemer, our closest friend. We love you, dear Savior. We ask this in your holy name. Amen. We rise so we can sing our closing song together. Lord of all creation, the water.
Give the Lord a hand. I want to leave us with a thought this morning from 2 Corinthians 5.17. Paul says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new what? He is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. You may think that because you received Christ some years ago, that's it. <laughs> no, there's a whole lot of growing that God wants to have take place in our lives as we yield to him on a moment by moment basis and allow his word to so speak to our hearts changing us he makes us more like his son Jesus Christ the Lord Jesus wants to flesh out his life his love his righteousness to the world and he does it not through the stars not through the animals not through the ocean or the mountains. He does it through you and me. So how will people know that our God, our Jesus, is the creator of heaven and earth? Unless they see his creation work in us. So this week, as we go out, 
may we humble ourselves before the Lord and say, Lord, I want that new creation that you've given to me to be fleshed out so that others don't come in contact with me. They come in contact with you. And they also will become new creations in Christ. Amen? Now, right now, we're going to head over to the fellowship hall. We're going to have a time to say a sorrowful, a sorrowful goodbye to our buddy, to our dear friend, Pastor Jeremy. Let's give him a hand right here. We love you, buddy. We're going to miss you. So let's go over. Let's have fellowship together. Let's enjoy our time and let Jeremy know how much we love him. God bless you all. God bless you online. We're glad you joined with us today. Head over to the annex, guys. That's where the food is going to be served in the annex.